Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today we are joined by Jaren, who is the owner of the Urban Aviary. And welcome, Jaren. Thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. Of course. I'm excited to talk to you all about quail today. Can you tell us more about uh, the Urban Aviary and what you do? Uh, sure. So I can give you a little background first, if that's okay, Nicole. I was born and raised in a small mountain rural community in northern Utah, and um, I got into raising quail uh, the same way you did, actually, which was through falconry. I learned to raise quail to, to feed our raptors when I was about 15 years old. So that's how I got started in it. And then, you know, as most of us do, we uh, end up, you know, going off to college and doing our own thing. And so I ended up leaving the that small community and moving to the city. And I was there for about eight or 10 years before I started getting uh, involved in agriculture and started seeing some of the problems in our food system. And so I decided to start raising animals uh, on my own while I was there in the city on a little, uh, a tiny little urban lot. And I, I really wanted to do as much as I could in a small space. And I had never really raised animals before other than quail. And so I figured that's just where I would start with. Um, if they were good enough for raptors to eat, I figured they were good enough for me to eat. So I started uh, raising them in my garage along with uh, rabbits and ducks and chickens. And, uh, you know, kind of went gung-ho from the, from the get-go until, uh, well, actually before I go there, I, and I started the, the YouTube channel about that time to teach other people about backyard agriculture and kind of uh, document my my learning experiences and, and, and what I've learned. And then one day, something just happened that kind of changed the, the direction of my life for forever. I got a letter from our city that said that we were going to have to get rid of all of our ducks and chickens. We had, I guess, not enough property, not enough uh, space in our backyard to be allowed. Chickens and ducks weren't allowed because they were a farm animal and just weren't acceptable in our area. They weren't legal in our area. And that really broke my heart. And so we still had the rabbit, still had the quail, but I decided that I wanted to to still be able to do those things and live, live the way I wanted to. So I packed up my family and we moved back to the hometown I grew up in onto a, a two acre property. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to be, um, do whatever I want. I can do sheep now. If I want, I can do, um, you know, a large flock of ducks. I can do all the things I want to, but over that time when I was in the city, I actually accrued a, a decent following on the YouTube channel. And I had a lot of people that were emailing me asking for help. And I kind of felt like if I started to uh, go to the uh, traditional agricultural route, I felt like I was leaving a lot of people behind. So what I did is I decided um, that I want to, wanted to start doing tons of little projects on my two acre property. And so instead of doing a bunch of uh, large ruminant animals or larger like sheep or something, I decided I want to do, you know, five or six different layouts of, of how to raise quail and then, you know, start uh, into microgreens and aquaponics and aquaculture and uh, small scale food forestry and, and things like that. Um, so that's where I, where I ended up at. And that's where the urban aviary is at right now. It's the, the one-stop quail shop where you, everything you need to start raising quail, you can, you can get there. And that's kind of where it, where it all came from. Awesome. And I know, you know, there's such a demand for people that do live in, you know, an urban setting or a smaller, you know, acreage land that that do want to be self-sufficient and do want to be able to raise their own food. And and so I think there's definitely a huge demand for for people that would be interested in, in, you know, like quail and things like that. Right, right. And that's the, that's the wonderful thing about quail and that I, that I learned first off is, you know, when that, when the city sent me that letter, um, and I went and looked over the regulations, and I saw, yeah, they, the ducks and chickens, they uh, they can definitely tell me I can't that I've got to get rid of, but they have no regulations on quail, <laughs> and and very few uh, locales I think do have those those kind of restrictions. So I found just through that experience, it was a it's a rough experience, but I'm kind of glad I went through it so that maybe other people can can learn from that and understand that, you know, maybe they can they can actually have fresh eggs and meat from their backyard even though they live in the city and they can't have chickens or ducks. Well, just like you said, just because you can't. Uh raise them outside and you know if you even if you have an HOA you can raise them in your garage so right I've, there's always I've actually raised options. them in the house Nicole I've I, oh my goodness yeah, I, I, I've, <laughs> and I've been experimenting with all sorts of stuff like that and I actually um, have raised them in aquariums and terrariums 
inside mm-hmm. the house. Like I had a back at the uh, the old property back in the city. Um, I had one room dedicated to it. I was growing microgreens and I had, you know, a few tanks of quail and was, you know, getting a dozen eggs a day out of the basement. So, I mean, literally no matter what you, where you're at, you don't have to be on 50 acres. You can be in an apartment in the city and you can have your own eggs and meat coming out of your, out of your home. And nobody would be the wiser that you have a, a little farm room in your house. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Forget a spare bedroom. You need a spare farm room. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So that leads us to quail. What are some reasons that people would want to raise quail instead of chickens other than, you know, what we've already talked about? Well, yeah, like we talked about, the the obvious is, is you know, they, they lend themselves to small spaces really well. Um, the great thing is that you can you can literally raise um, the equivalent of like, the what would you say the average backyard flock is for someone, like four to six hens? Yeah, probably – about yeah, that. somewhere in there. So, I mean, that equivalent of eggs can be done in a, a four by four space in your garage if you use a, a stacking system. So you can you can have the 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 output that those chickens have, but you don't have to have anywhere for them to roam around. They don't have to be let out. Caternix quail, which are the ones I'm I'm specifically talking about, they were actually um, originated in Japan and they've been bred for I don't know, two thousand plus years to be bred in cages. Um, like that, so they're actually they're actually happy being that way. They're they're ground dwelling creatures that don't come back to home to a coop like a chicken does. So they're just happy being there together with their other you know others of their kind in that cage. It, some people think it's it's kind of that it's cruel to keep quail in cages, but the fact is they're. I'm gonna go on a rant here, Nicole. Are, okay, knock are, it, are you, knock yourself out. <laughs> are you familiar with the term anthropomorphism? I am not. Okay, so anthropomorphism is when we portray human like characteristics and feelings on non-human objects. Okay, um, sure. So uh, seeing quail in cages is equivalent. People will will argue that, you know, you wouldn't want to be shoved with five other people in a small room in your house on one couch. You know, and I'm like, well, that's th- that's true, but but we're people. Quail are, they're, they're flock creatures, they're ground creatures that, and I mean, besides being a lower life form, they they feel safe together. Um, I actually have raised them in an in an aviary setup where mm-hmm. they have a, a ton of space to roam around, and you watch them in there, and they still huddle together really close. They don't really, you know, spread out and wander out that much. They stay that close to each other because that's what they do for safety. It's the safety and numbers mentality, and that's how they live in the wild. So that's 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 one obstacle to think about to overcome. I'm all about overcoming obstacles. That's kind of what my channel is about is trying to show that it's easy and try and, uh, you know, weed out the fluff and BS so that people can actually start doing this instead of just getting stuck in analysis paralysis, trying sure, to figure I like out it. if they should or not. Yeah. People like to overcomplicate things I found. So, so simple is better. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, the deal with that. They're, they're happy in those smaller spaces and that's why they, they lend themselves so well to, to urban environments. And even, you know, I mean, if you have a shed in your backyard, you can do it. Even if you don't have a, a, attached or detached garage if you have a, a little tough shed or a little you can get a, a shed a cheap shed like that from home depot for a few hundred dollars you know if, if nothing else and i mean people i think spend spend about that much or more on on a chicken coop yep when i worked at the or volunteered rather at the uh, raptor center we had them in a eight by eight tough shed or whatever and we were pumping out hundreds of quail out of there yeah and that's and that's the cool thing about it too that that uh, reminds me of you saying that is how how much you can pump out in that small space because they have such a quick turnaround time. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the benefits is that, and you and you'll know, I know you'll know all this, but they it's seventeen days of incubation, so they're uh, a shorter time to hatch than than chickens are. But then the really cool thing is that they are six to eight weeks before they are fully grown to slaughter size and laying eggs. So they are they are fully productive. And ready to do their jobs at at six to eight weeks, which which to me is just incredible. And compared to like a broiler chicken, their food intake is so much less. Oh yeah. So do you um, predominantly? You said raise the Caternix. Why did you choose the Caternix over some of the other breeds of quail that are available? Oh, there's a couple of reasons. One, one is that there are no regulations, at least here in Utah, on Caternix quail because they are not considered a game bird because they are not. Uh, native. They're a bird from Japan and they're not considered a uh, farm poultry animal, which means you can have them anywhere. It doesn't matter if you have them in your your backyard or in your house or or wherever. The, the law can't really come down on you and tell you to get rid of them because they're, you know, they're exempt from any of those, uh, those rules and, and laws. And the other thing is that some of these other breeds like your, your Californias, your Bob Whites that, uh, you know, will be around locally, 
they don't have the same growth time. They don't get the size as quickly. And also they don't uh, lay like the Caternix do. They get a, a bit bigger, so the bird size is actually better, but they don't get the the rapid growth rate. And they're not going to lay for you year-round. Um, the Caternix will lay an egg a day year-round if they have the proper lighting, just like a chicken will. So do you raise the uh, the jumbo Caternix or do you raise the standards? I raise a little bit of everything. That's something I want to talk about too is the do, – do you know or you or – I'm just curious. No, um, do you know what the definition of a jumbo is? I uh, believe it's – is it weight or egg size? Is it weight like yeah, 15? So, I don't know. Right. Right. I'll let, I'll let you tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just curious because uh, some people do and some people don't. There's there's a lot of misconception about it. That's why I was just curious. But yeah, the the standard is to anything 10 to 15 ounces or 10 ounces and or over is considered a jumbo. Now, the thing that sucks is that not everybody adheres to that. So you go to somebody on Craigslist that's selling, you know, quote unquote jumbo Caternix and you get them home and you've never raised quail before and you go, oh, these must be jumbos. But if you weigh them, they're like, you know, six, seven, eight ounces. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the, still the same breed of animal. Jumbo isn't a different breed or a different anything. It's just like the difference between, you know, two pups in a litter of a, a, a litter of labs. You know, one's bigger than another. You know, it's that type of difference. They're still the same breed and everything. Some are just larger than other. But anything jumbo is going to be 10 to 15 ounces. Unfortunately, not everybody, you know, agrees to, uh, to that. Like... I mean, the, the standard's out there, but not everybody will be honest about it, if that makes sense. So sure. just because somebody mm -hmm. says it's a jumbo doesn't mean it's a jumbo. That, that's, I, I kind of hate that term because of that. I've, I've come to accept it a little bit better, but I just don't like how it gets abused by a lot of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so I raise jumbos, and those are going to be for meat. Um, that's what they're – I mean, and they still will do everything else. They lay just like other birds do. The benefit of having some of the standards, the smaller sizes, is that if you get those and breed certain – color breeds together, you can actually get sex link, uh, Caternix. Oh, really? so you can actually tell by, feather, yeah, you can tell by feather color, feather color that they have hatch. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a new thing. I don't know if it's a new thing, but I mean, I ship the eggs. I've got them on my website, um, on the urban aviary.com, but they're, they're, they're kind of handy, but they don't get to the jumbo size because if you start doing the breeding with the jumbos, the larger size ones, the colors for the sex link don't, don't breed as true. Oh, okay. So there is a yeah, benefit there to the standard size too. But. And what about like some of the other variations, you know, the Texas A&Ms or anything? Do you breed those? Uh, yeah. So I, I breed, oh, I don't know how many different kinds <laughs> I've got. I've got. I've got every coloration you can think of. But yeah, the, um, the A&Ms, for those that don't know what those are, the Texas A&Ms were actually um, just uh, white Caternix um, that were bred at the Texas A&M. Uh, the university t for trying to make a uh, meat bird that had a good skin color, you know, just like with a chicken or a duck or anything else, they, you know, a lighter feathered color feathered uh, bird will have a lighter skin, which is, doesn't make it any better, but you know, in the eyes of the consumer, they see that and it looks nice. So, you know, whatever. Right. Um, but yeah. that's what they were, <laughs> that's what they were trying to breed there. Um, but that's not every uh, white bird is a Texas A&M. Texas a and M's are would be ones that came from that specific breeding program. Mm -hmm. um, the the other name that you might know, I mean, they still generally are called Texas a and M's, and that's fine. It's just what they're what they're called. Um, but the the traditional name form are English. They're English white. Um, so I do have I do have those. Um, my my favorite are the Italians. They're they're some of the only ones like the the general color, the pharaohs. That you can actually tell um, the difference between hens and roosters by the the feathers on their breast, the color on their feathering on their breast, mm -hmm. and they're I just think they're pretty. They're a, a you know a white bird, but they still have the the markings of the pharaoh. Mm -hmm. um, but then yeah, I mean we've got uh, a silver line, we've got uh, rosettas, we've got um, some falb fees. I mean, there's all sorts of of different colorations that I mean snowflakes. They're I, I should have made a list and put together and told you all of them what I've got. They're all they're all listed on the website under the mixed colored eggs. But I mean, there's tons out there, and there's more that are coming out all the time that are being oh, yeah. being bred and new colors coming out all the time. So if somebody and I, we could maybe talk about maybe a setup here in a minute, but as far as breed, somebody that's brand new to quail and just wants to get started, let's say for a dual purpose meat and egg bird, what would you recommend? Which breed for them? I, I would recommend either. Um, the, the jumbo pharaohs, um, the jumbo wilds or, you know, the jumbo wild jumbo pharaohs, 
or the Italians just because they're easy to distinguish the the feather color. But other than that, like all the breeds are the same um, as far as egg laying goes. I mean, I, I always, it goes back to the, you know, talking about dogs, the, the same litter of labs. One might be yellow and uh, one might be chocolate and one might be black. All came from the same parents. They're still, I mean, that doesn't mean one's going to be a, you know, a better hunting dog than the other. It's just a, a feather color thing, not necessarily, um, there's not necessarily other traits that are attached to it, but it is beneficial with the pharaohs, the jumbo wilds, or the Italians, as long as well as some others, like some of the silver lines, where you can actually tell the difference between the males and females um, just by looking at their feather color once they're an adult. Because uh, some of the other birds, it's, you have to sit there and watch at six to eight weeks, and you spend end up spending some time watching them to see who crows. And then you have to put a band on their leg to mark them and figure out who's who and everything because they the males and females look identical. So if I was to say one that somebody wanted to start out with, I would look at Jumbo Wilds. So one thing that I've seen online, kind of a um, common question, and I've had people contact me about quail too, and they typically say the Texas A&M, so I'll just run with that because that's what most people ask. Are the Texas A&M just a white skin or a white meat? Because people often ask me for white meat quail because I, I had a couple extra coternics at one point that I was selling locally. So are they all the quail then dark meat or is there any variation amongst them in that aspect? They are all identical. Even even that Texas A&M program that was trying to get a lighter skin bird. I, I've skinned and plucked every every color of and breed of coternics out there and I have not found a difference in skin color at all and definitely not in the meat. Um the meat is generally just in any of them is about like a, a heritage breed chicken is. Mm-hmm. So kind of along those same lines, um, have you come across any, you know, common misconceptions about raising quail? Oh yeah. This is, this is something that I, <laughs> I talk about on, on my channel. It's, and it's kind of something that's kind of become a cornerstone of what I'm trying to do is there's a lot of people that try to overcomplicate, like we were talking about earlier, um, I'll tell you a story what what started this for me. So I was listening to a podcast years ago, and I don't remember which podcast it was. It was a it was a big popular one about raising chickens, some backyard chicken podcast. And they had this gal on, and she's you know she's talking about how she's been raising quail for what twenty thirty years or something like that, and um, she just is going on about all these technical details of things. And I'm just like, man, you are making this sound so much more complicated than it really is. And then I started looking on you know social media and, and different Facebook groups and people talking about all this stuff and asking all these questions. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's all these things people are getting so hung up on that, that are non issues that I think stop people from getting into it. But, uh, one of the myths about quail that I think is <laughs> drives me nuts is like we had talked about earlier, they're, they're okay being together close together in a cage. And some people will tell you that you can only have one bird per square foot. Yes. And, I see that one all the time. <laughs> and, and I don't know where like, uh, you, you can't find any, uh, you know, a scholarly documentation or information on that. It's just like something that gets thrown out there and it's just become this thing that just this floats out there that people just regurgitate to everybody that asks the question. But I mean, I'll put three birds together, three, three birds per square foot. And if I'm just raising them for meat and not having them as breeders, I'll put more than that. Um, if they're just getting raised up to slaughter size, I have no problem having them. And as long as they're not stepping over top of each other and they, you know, I mean, you don't want to pack them in there so that they can't turn themselves around or anything. But, you know, they they feel that security when they're when they're closer together like that. And that goes back to that whole anthropomorphism thing, which I won't re rehash. But that's yeah, that's one big that that drives me nuts. Are you staying awake? Uh, you know, I'm on my uh, fourth coffee, so I think I think I can make it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> no, I love talking about quail, and I don't usually get to talk to other people that know about quail. And I'm by no means an expert, but I enjoy it. And I have <laughs> just enough to at least you know be able to have a somewhat interesting conversation. So this is great. Right. This is better than coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't get to talk to people about quail ever. Well, well, certainly not people that that know to that same level, you know. Yeah, have that same understanding. And when I was looking at your website, just as an aside, I didn't see that uh, you had eggs, and I just lost one of my breeders, and I I only was down to three to be honest with you but i've been wanting to get more and so i'm gonna have to uh get a hold of you for some eggs here after this yeah sure we can do that my incubators are full right now but i'd like to get some more quail <laughs> so the, uh, another myth that we we kind of touched on a little bit earlier was that the feather color and genetics so you 
you don't really get, like we were talking about before, a difference in uh, egg production, a difference in meat quality or how dark the meat is or anything like that based on the, the color of the quail there. Like I said, it's, it's a difference between a, a black lab, a yellow lab, the chocolate lab. It's, you know, the only difference you're going to have is size. And the, the bigger birds are obviously going to be better for meat production and have more meat on them. So that's another one. The one that drives me absolutely insane, and <laughs> people still uh, argue with me about this, but there, there's this, and I don't know, you might you might know about this, but that quail have to have a certain cage height. Um, they have to be, you know, they have to be shorter because quail supposedly will jump up, hit their heads on cages and break their necks. Yes. And so I there's agree. this, there's yes. this. There's this theory that you've got to have a short – your cage has to be short so they don't get enough steam to jump up and do that. Yeah. Yep, um, not enough loft. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> so just to put it put this kind of in perspective of what kind of force that takes to do that, I don't know how you process quail. I'll try not to be too graphic here, but I can process a quail with my bare hands. And usually oh, yeah. from my falconry days, that's how we did it because it was fast. We just – one hand around the body and one hand on the head and we pull the head off. They're small mm-hmm. birds. It's easy to do. It's instant for them. And I mean, it, it takes a, a little bit of force to get it off, but you can do it pretty easily. But now like trying to think that a quail, I'm, I'm trying to think of the muscles it takes to do that. So the muscles in my arms or anybody's arms that it takes, the muscle groups that have to be used to pull that off and get that separated. Now we're going to say that a quail has that equivalent muscle mass in its body to jump up and hit its head and break its neck. Yeah, I feel like that runs a little, uh, (laughs) stretches the truth a little bit, but I I personally have experienced if I have them in a cage that's too tall, sometimes they'll jump and then hit their heads and then kind of cause, uh, you know, like cut themselves sure, you know, yeah. from doing that. Yeah. But that, that's they've never a killed themselves. That's usually a problem though, right? How many times you can jump up and hit your head on the ceiling before you stop jumping, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, they can They can definitely get hurt. It's the whole, you've got to be careful because your birds are going to die if you <laughs> yeah. if you have them like that. And I've, I've talked to lots of other breeders that, that have – that have raised, you know, hundreds of thousands of birds, more than I have. And there's one breeder that has told me that he has seen it happen twice in his entire oh. career. He's like, yeah, I b- jumped up and hit its head and like, yeah, its neck was broken and yada, yada. But, and he's raised hundreds of thousands and he's had it happen twice. Hmm. You know what I mean? So I mean, well, I guess anything. So it's a, yeah. I mean, flukes happen all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, some people get attacked by sharks, but what are the, what are the odds? That's <laughs> <You're happen? right. laughs> sure. So. Yeah, that's that's the other one that kind of drives me nuts, and and not that it really matters whether or not, because I mean, and sometimes it could even kill them if they get a if they you know crack their head or whatever. But the point is, just like what I was talking about earlier, is not to let little hangups like that stop you from starting mm-hmm. raising quail. It's it's easy. Like if I would have thought about this when I was a kid, I don't know why I haven't been raising quail this whole time and producing my own food because I could have done it anywhere. Through all the moves right. I've made through the city and everywhere I've been, I could have taken this with me and done it my entire life and had better quality food on my table. It's just like with chickens. I tell people, granted, you should not put the chicken in a tiny cage like they do battery style you know, right. chickens with just the feeders up from. You shouldn't do that. But keep in mind, they do – they are able to survive in that environment. So anything Correct. that you give them that's – better than that they're going to be just fine yes <laughs> that's how quail are they don't know what they what they don't have when you mm-hmm. I've, I've raised them in cages in battery cages and you go and put them into a an aviary like i said before you know they don't know what to do with themselves they're just like we're gonna stay over here in the corner and stay together yep. you know they've been bred that way for so many thousands of years that they just like don't know what what to do with all that space they'd rather be together where they feel you know safe and secure yeah i've had that same experience and so now i just have a uh, like a rabbit hutch kind of thing that I that I've got them in just because I only have the one tier so I don't have a stacked cage system Mm -hmm. but yeah if you try to put them on the ground it doesn't seem to matter to them too much yeah I'll have to uh I'm I'm gonna be having our cages up on the the website soon and I'll have to see if I can get you uh hooked up with a new system so you can try it out try some of those multi-layer battery cages because I've I've done that same thing with the the hutch and it works well but it's really nice having that you know open wired faced all the way around and having multiple levels. I'll see if I can get you hooked up with one of those. I would love that. I've been actually looking for something like that, but I haven't been able to find a good cage system that was meant for quail that was, you know, affordable. So right. that's been my limitation. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll have some up on the, the website here shortly and I'll, I'll get one to you, but I mean, you can have one for, I think the one that I think we're selling the one that I'm, I'm using right now. It's a, a 30 inch wide double double tier. Um, I think it'll do about 20 birds. And I want to say it was 149. 
for the cage. Oh, wow, that's really reasonable. And it, I mean, that comes with free shipping, and um, it comes with all the waterers that you'll need, the feeding trays. It literally comes together, or it comes with everything, and all you need is a, a bucket to hook up for a reservoir. You have to drill a hole in a bucket and, you know, for the reservoir for the water cups, mm-hmm. and, and that's it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a great price. I know the other ones I was looking at, I think they were like almost 400 plus shipping. So yeah, and it was not doable. Yeah, we, we, we've got those too. <laughs> the, but those, the, I mean, those are the, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, five tier, 36 inch wide that'll do, you know, dozens and dozens of quail. But right. all, all of our cages are free shipping to the continental US. Awesome. Well, that kind of rolls into one of the questions I was going to ask you. So if somebody said, I want to raise quail, how do I get started? So obviously they need a cage system, which you have an amazing price on those. And then they would need the birds, which we talked about already. So what what else would somebody need to get started? So there's a few basic things that quail need. The first is shelter. So whether that's, um, you know, your garage or a um, a shed. Um, you can also keep cages outside and keep them covered. They don't um, need to actually be inside a building, but they do need to be protected from wind and rain. Um, these birds can stand high temperatures and very cold temperatures, but they they don't like being cold and wet. So as long as you keep them out of the wind and keep them dry, they're going to be happy. Um, I've had mine down into you know like ten below here where I'm at in northern Utah. And in the summer, it's got gets up to like you know into the the, the low 90s, and they they've done just fine. So they they do need the whatever shelter you're going to have that's basically going to keep the rain off and keep the wind out, and then the cages to keep them in. Um, and then the only other things they need are um, food, water, and security. And the security part comes with the caging. I mean, you've got to be careful of predators, and um, obviously, if you've got them in the garage or something, um, that that's going to be limited. You're only looking at possibly rat problems or you know, your, your four-legged feline and canine friends in the house are going to be the only things you're going to have to worry about. But security is something from, from predators that, that needs to be, um, addressed. But if you're getting started, all you need is figure out where you're going to put the cages, get the cages. Um, you can buy birds or you can buy an incubator and eggs and incubate your own, which if you're going to get serious about quail, a lot of people will, you know, put their toe in the water first about and get either adult birds or chicks, which um, there, there's no problem with that, especially if you can find them local. Um, not not everybody can find uh, birds, chicks locally. Um, if you can't do that, there are some people that are willing to ship them. Quail don't really do that well in shipping. We don't ship, at least not right now, we don't. And I don't know if we ever will ship chicks or adults. Um, but, I mean, if you can find them locally on Craigslist or, or whatever uh, local – thing you have to to find them you can always do that but i i recommend starting off with eggs in an incubator because you're you're figuring out how to do everything from the get-go you can get everything you need literally to start raising quail shipped to your door if you start with that incubator start with the sh- the, the hatching eggs that you can get shipped to you and you learn the process because if you're going to be doing this you're going to want to have your own birds and get uh new birds because about every year you're going to replace your birds if you're especially if you're slaughtering and, and eating them because after that point they get a little tough and you don't really want to want to eat them but if you're not into meat and you just want eggs they'll go for a couple years yeah so back to it an incubator and eggs or if you want to do live birds and can find them locally then great um i recommend eggs in an incubator and doing the whole process which is cool to see anyways i mean i don't know about you you you, you have kids uh i have a stepdaughter okay did, did she, do you incubate at all does she get to see birds hatch oh yeah i've got my incubators full right now and, <laughs> and i involve her in as much of it as i can i know and it's, it's it's so fun for them i mean it's just as fun for me as as it is for my boys but that's such a cool thing for the for the kids to be able to see that they love it oh yeah um but then you'll just need a, a brooder which you can do super cheap super simple you can get a heat lamp at you know your local farm supply store uh, you can get on Amazon. I mean, you can literally get all this stuff. Everything, like I said, you can get shipped to your door. You can get a brooder lamp off Amazon. You can get a, a brooder kit off Amazon. I just buy a rubber tote mm-hmm. from Walmart. That's all I've done. You can get them for as cheap as 10 bucks. I got the $20 one because it's the biggest. But then all you need is some pine shavings to put in the bottom of that. You need a feeder and waterer. And that's really much, pretty much all you need other than food. There will be on the website too here coming up soon. There will be like complete starter packs and everything of, of what you need. 
um, and different levels and tiers of of all of that. But that's that's the gist of it. There, there's not a whole lot to it. I know I just rambled for a bit and maybe made it sound more complicated. But if you if you just remember the things that they need, their their basic things is food, water, shelter, and security. Everything that fall everything they need falls into those four things. So expanding on food, I have I have two feed questions for you. Sure. Um, what kind what what protein uh, feed do you recommend people feed their adult birds? I recommend when they're being when you're getting them from chick to adult size, um, the higher the protein, the better. Um, I feed my chicks a twenty eight percent protein uh, turkey starter. Mm-hmm. Which is really easy to find. If if in your area you can't find game bird feed, you usually can find turkey starter. Yeah, and that's that's really easy. It's get, it's mashed super small, so the chicks can can eat it. It doesn't need to be ground up or anything. Um, so those are the two things. And then you feed that to them till six or eight weeks. And then there's some controversy going on about once they are to that size, what protein content they need because I've. I'm going to be doing my own experiment here to uh, with different sets of cages to see what the difference is. But I know of, of one breeder that has actually calculated egg size on different uh, protein levels. Um, and he said, has found that eggs get smaller, the, the bird's eggs get smaller, the lower the protein content is. And once you get about below 24%, he has found that the egg size just gets you know smaller than it is to be worth not paying extra for a little bit higher protein feed. But I, the breeder that I, I know that I go through and I've got all my flock from, he feeds his birds uh, 20%. And when they're adults, he still uses the high protein as chicks, but all of his eggs are, are just fine and he does it till 20%. So I kind of think it depends on some different factors. So I'm going to be doing some more experimenting with that. But I mean, if you have, if all you can get your hands on for adults is like an 18%, that's better than nothing. And it's not going like, to stop them from laying. The higher the protein, the better. Though I, I feed my birds the same stuff their their entire life. So, the 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 gist of it is, if you can get the highest protein content you content you can, but if not, I mean, the, um, an eighteen percent will will not stop them from laying. You'll still get egg production. Um, if you feed them that low from the time they're a chick, they will not get the six to eight week uh, size growth within that time frame, and it will stunt their growth. So when they are chicks, it is very very important up until adult size that they have. Um, like a minimum of 25, 26% and up to 30 is, is even better. I know that with uh, some other birds, typically, you know, you can get too high of a protein like, you know, with turkeys and then they kind of get leg deformities and stuff. So I guess that's not really so much of an issue with the quail. No, no, they don't have any issues with that. You, like I said, I've never had problems with that with, you know, leg problems, splayed legs, any of that kind of stuff with, with any of my birds. And I've, I've fed them. I mean, they, they have 28% turkey starter feed from the day they're born till the day they die. Oh, okay. And so what do you do as far as feeders? Because I've always struggled with food waste with my quail and I've tried a thousand different feeders and I haven't come to a solution that I totally love just yet. That's something that everybody fights, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I've built my own homemade ones and I know those were a disaster that made a huge yeah. pipe and oh my gosh. Me God, too. <laughs> that was a, such a disaster. <laughs> These new ones that, that, that we've got, we're actually redesigning the feeders again so that they're larger so that they can hold more feed so you don't have to worry about your birds running out of food during the day. But really the trick is just putting less in, especially on like... I guess I'm referring my cages, but I'll refer to my cages for now. The, the cages I have, you don't have to put, fill them more than a quarter of the way full because they can reach all the way down into the bottom. They can stretch their necks quite a long ways. And when you're building them, I know we want to get them as close as they can and make it as easy as easy for them as we can. But be surprised at how how far they can reach down and stretch and and get the food. But another solution I found if you are building your own and it is – creating a mess is I put um, something underneath to catch anything that falls out, um, like a tote or something underneath, and it'll catch the food that, that kicks out. But other than that, really the biggest thing is just they, they don't need to have their feeders completely full. If you have a, a tall feeder that they can get their head in, head down into and don't, don't put very much in it and make them work to actually get it, that will minimize most of your feed waste. That's a good tip because that was always a struggle and, and it got to the point that I just accepted the food waste and the mice right. me for it. And yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating. I had that same problem. I, I, uh, I had mine wasting so much that, uh, I would put those totes underneath 
and so, and mo- it would catch most of it under the totes, but some would still fall on, out onto the floor. And my my bins of grain that I had underneath them became accidental mouse traps, and I ended up yep. like having, you know, a dozen mice at a time falling down into them and getting stuck. Which was great; I was able to get rid of them. But I mean, it, I think the last time I did that, when I did it in my old garage, I think I pulled over fifty mice out trapping oh um, from from the feed waste. Yeah, they they move in there and they know they got a steady food source and. You you let them go with it, and they'll 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 have their whole family there before you know it. Yeah, that's uh, I feel like that's a whole another conversation for a different episode right. is <laughs> dealing with mice in the in the uh, farm. But so you mentioned also um, some lighting requirements to keep the birds laying around. What do you do for that? Um, so I put my lights on a timer. Just a I, I just have uh, fluorescent lights. Um, shop lights that I hang in my my quail shed, and the timer that that you you just set the timer to fourteen hours. So whatever that those hours are, um, for you where you're you know if you if you want to have it come on if they they're going to get their daylight in the morning from the sun coming in, and then you have it kick on for a few hours at night after it goes dark, or if you just kick it on to actually go on fourteen hours a day. But that's the that's the magic number is fourteen hours. If you set it to fourteen hours a day, and they it doesn't have to be shining directly on them but it doesn't need to be in the space where they're at. It just needs to be, you know, at least having amb- ambient light in there. So they feel like it's, it's, you know, springtime, summertime. So they know that their bodies know that it's time to lay. Yeah. I know that a lot of people, and I didn't even know this until recently, but egg production is based on hormones that are released based on hours of daylight. So Correct. that's why we need to replicate the, like you said, the warmer months with longer days. So yep. uh, the 14 hours. You're, same with chickens. Chickens do the same thing. Yep, exactly like chickens. You just got to fool their hormones into doing what you want them to do. Yeah. So what recommendations do you have for breeding? So somebody, they bought their quail, they've got, you know, however many birds, and they've got their their setup. So if they want to breed for a sustainable meat source, you know, what's your ratio of male to female, and how do you recommend breeding and, you know, butchering to keep, uh, supply of, of viable breeders? Sure. A lot of questions there. You might have to remind me one at a time. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but uh, as far as males to females, I mean, the 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 max I do is five to one. Um, four to one is more ideal, um, but five to one will work just fine. I would never go beyond that um, if you want to have good fertility and uh, for your rooster to be able to, to maintain all of those hens. Um, obviously the, the fewer you have, the better your fertility is going to be, the more sure your fertility will be. But if you get too few of hens, then your rooster is going to end up picking on your hens too much and, yeah. uh, they start losing scalp feathers and back feathers and, and then your hens start fighting back at your roosters and kicking the crap out of them. And it's just ugly. So, yes. <laughs> um, five max, I would say four is, is ideal. And I would never do less than three. And I still really don't even like three. I, I do five to one with my birds and, uh, I don't have any issues with, with my fertility. Yeah. Quail are, uh, especially aggressive. So <laughs> you gotta have enough hens. I've found out out the hard way as well. Right. Yeah. I, I hear people a lot that keep them as pets and I, you'll see something come up on a Facebook post sometime for someone saying, I've got, uh, I've got one a hen quail, one Caternix hen I've I've got from somebody. I need a a, a buddy for him. Does anybody got a rooster I can take? <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, oh my gosh, one rooster and one hen, they're going to have a, a miserable, miserable relationship. So you don't want your breeding quail to get too old so that you can, you know, maintain, I know, their fertility. And then, you know, if you're going to process them as well, if you let them go too long, then they don't process well. So what's your recommendation as far as breeding them to have a continuous uh, supply while maintaining your breeders? Well, my, my general rule of thumb is what I do every year is just every year springtime comes, you get rid of your old, you, you take some of your eggs from your flock, you incubate them, you, uh, you get your new, your new, new birds hatched out. And then you, if you're going to eat your, your uh, previous flock, you, process them or if you aren't into that and you're just doing it for eggs you can get rid of them i mean even if you you can always find somebody to take them for free if nothing else you put them up oh, for yeah. free somebody will somebody will come and take your quail and they'll eat them <laughs> yeah <laughs> but if, if you're just in it for eggs and you're uh keeping them year-round 14 hours of light you could probably get two seasons out of them 
for eggs. Um, beyond that, I, I don't like how much the viability drops. If you just want to play it safe, I just I just make it a rule that every spring, just once a year, your flock gets you, you hatch out eggs from your flock and your old flock goes away and then you you'll never have problems with uh, fertility or viability do you do any separation so that you don't have inbreeding a little bit i, I mostly just arrange birds to where they get along and don't pick on each other they're kind of like people in the sense that uh um, some get along with others and some don't get along with others so that's all i really do between um, moving birds around but um, as far as inbreeding goes, I, I don't pay as much attention to it as I think a lot of other people do. I mean, I've never had birds coming out with, uh, you know, 12 toes or anything like that. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not super concerned about it. That's another one of those things I think it's that people worry a, a little more about than than they need to. I know I talked to another uh, predominant breeder when I started getting into quail myself, and I believe that he said it's acceptable i guess to breed them up to five generations to each other before things start to get funny so i feel like that would be uh, a challenge you know if, if you're constantly rotating your flock eventually you're going to get you know they're not they're not going to be related the whole time so yeah yeah I, I could get on board with that that sounds about right with me i, I don't think they start growing extra toes and, and playing banjos until <laughs> a while after that yeah it's sixth generation and you're out. Right. Um, <laughs> do you want to talk more about incubation? I know we kind of talked about it yeah. briefly. Yeah. Yeah. We can go into detail on incubation. So as far as breeding, then what recommendations do you have as far as, you know, egg collection and incubation and, and things like that? Okay. So for egg collection, what I do first off, when you're collecting your eggs, something that will affect their viability is going to be how long they sit out in the elements and in whether it's too cold, uh, too warm. I don't really worry about too much, but if you live, uh, somewhere like, like we do, we get, we get colder weather. And if they're sitting out there for too long, that can, that can hurt their viability. So if you don't have them in a, a heated area and, and I don't mean they need to have it up to 72 degrees room temperature, you know, they're, they're still animals, but, um, as long as it's not, you're not collecting them and it's not getting down into, you know, the, you know, below 40 degrees or, or anything like that. They're, they're just fine. So I just, I try to collect them as quick as I can if the weather is cooler and they're not heated. And then I, I just collect them, take them in the house and keep them at room temperature. Um, you don't need to do anything special with them, put them in a specific temperature, just as long as they're at room temperature. But, you know, I think most people keep their houses between 68 and 72 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that'll, that'll do just fine. And then before you get them in the incubator, before you actually set them, the general rule I have is 10 days is going to be your optimal time. Um, once mm -hmm. the, an egg is, you know, more than 10 days old, the viability starts to go down a little bit. And I personally don't bother setting any eggs. I don't put any eggs in the incubator that are past two weeks old. Yeah. Um, but but 10 days is the general rule. I mean, the, the sooner you put them in, the better. But obviously, you can't, you know, every time you get 10 eggs a day or whatever, you can't just be throwing, throwing a new 10, 10 egg batch in your incubator. So 10 days is a general good rule. I would never go past two weeks. I know you shouldn't wash your eggs, but do you um, sterilize them with like oxygen or anything like nope. that? I, I don't do do anything with them. I've, I've never, uh, I guess I, I know a lot of people say there's a lot of things that, that need to be done and I don't know, maybe some of those things would improve results, but I, I've never, I mean, I don't wash eggs, but I've never sanitized or done anything at all with them. I, I've never, uh, candled my eggs. I know that's something a lot of people do. Like at a certain point you take your eggs out and candle them and throw the ones away that aren't viable, that aren't developing. Um, people say, if you don't, the eggs will explode in the incubator. And I know that's happened, but I've, I've done thousands of birds and never had it happen to me i'm sure it'll be miserable once it happens <laughs> i found that to be an issue more with your longer incubation eggs not so much your right. you know 17 days exactly it's gonna go wrong yep, ex exactly <laughs> um so i mean if that's something you want to do I, I i i feel it's not worth the trade-off for opening up the incubator and taking because i mean i incubate hundreds of eggs at a time so if i take them out they're cooling down to a lower temperature because they're out so long which which isn't a huge deal but i mean it's not worth the trade-off for me for the risk that an egg might explode yeah. Well, that's another thing too. I, I know people get worried about uh, during the incubation process if they're going to take them out and and incubate them. They're worried that you know something's going to happen. Their their hatch is ruined or or whatever. But you know my my ducks usually hatch out most of their eggs. And every time I go out to feed my ducks in the morning, she 
puts some straw on top of them and goes out. And she's out for 10 or 15 minutes eating and drinking and doing her thing. And, um, you know, that's, that's what mother birds do. It's a natural thing. So, I mean, if they're out for a little bit and cool down to room temperature or whatever, it's not going to be, be super detrimental either. Mm-hmm. Do you, have you noticed with, um, any of your varieties of Caternix, do they, do any of them ever sit on eggs or are they pretty much all <laughs> terrible mothers? They're, it's been pretty well bred out of them. It's, it's funny. Sometimes, yeah. um, if you have them in an aviary, um, they've got some nesting material, uh, a couple of them will do it sometimes they'll go and they'll sit on an egg. Um, but they, they're not consistent. I mean, I think the, I think I had one that consistently sat on a couple of eggs for three days and that was it. And she <laughs> abandoned it and I don't, and she had no idea what she was doing. And I don't know that, you know, if you want to, if you don't want an incubator and you want, uh, want a bird like that, that'll hatch your eggs, then, uh, get a silky chicken or a muscovy duck. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or Buff Orvington. They, they're pretty reliable broodies too. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I don't know what else to ask you. I think you've, you've literally covered everything I could possibly. I feel like if, if I didn't know how to raise quail after listening to you, I would feel confident <laughs> that I know what to do now. <laughs> You're making me blush. Oh, <laughs> So if somebody wants to hatch their own quail, what kind of recommendations do you have as far as an incubator? I've used several different models, and it all depends on what you're after, um, what you're trying to do. Um, I have a, a Brincia um, Advance, Max, or a Maxi 2 Advance, and that's a really good – I mean, they're they're a little more uh, pricey. I think they're they're in the $300 range, I believe. Um, but they're just kind of a nice one. They're, they're a dome style that you can see all the way through. Um, I think they do somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 30, 35 quail eggs. Um, but that's, a, that's a fun one to, to have in your house and it's fun for the kids for more of a hobbyist. If you're looking for something on the, the less expensive side, but, you, and you want to do more production and be able to hatch more eggs, uh, then the IncuView is a a really good model they they also have you know everything see-through on the top so you can actually watch um the eggs hatch and and everything on it is is automated i mean you set the temperature you set your um, parameters and everything and it does everything for you so you don't have to keep on top of it um that's a really good one um the i'm trying to think what the uh I, I haven't used them, but you maybe have to help remind me what's what's the most popular one you can think of i know that everybody gets they're the styrofoam Oh, the hoverbaiters. Uh, hoverbaiters, yeah. I've I've never used those. I, I know that a lot of people have good luck with them. Those are the economy ones. That's what most people get when they're starting out. I just I like to clean my incubators out because that's something. If you don't get it cleaned out and you have the eggshells and all the stuff sitting in your incubator from the last time and you don't clean it out, you can start getting diseases built up that your next batch will catch diseases from and and could have problems. And the styrofoam, it's hard to get anything in there to clean it well with any kind of disinfectant or anything because it can destroy the styrofoam. So that's the only reason I, I avoid those. If, if that's all you can get, then great. But just know you want to be cleaning with bleach or vinegar or something and it's eventually going <laughs> to deteriorate it and, and eat away around it. My favorite one that I have, and, and not everybody needs this, but if you're if you're wanting to get more into production or you want to hatch some chicks to sell locally to, to a feed store or something like that like I do, then you might look at a cabinet incubator. Uh, the one I use is from GQF. It's the 1202 Sportsman's model. And I think that that one will do 1,300 quail eggs at a time. It's uh, a higher-end one. Um, I, I don't know. What, what, what ones are you using, Nicole? So I have a lot of GQF products uh, for my battery brooders. But Represent. I use, um, yes, <laughs> I use uh, Arcom just because that's what I got started with. I bought one, it used, and it was great. And then I bought another one. And then I learned about cabinet incubators, and I really should have bought one of those instead. But sometimes <laughs> I, I hatch two different types of eggs, so whatever, it works out. But um I know that I've looked online and it seems like the newer sportsmen's aren't quite the same as the older ones. I've seen posts about uh, egg tray issues, uh, like the egg trays will fall. Oh, yeah. Apparently they came out with a new one in the last maybe year. They kind of, I don't know if they're they're making them different somehow. So 
I thought they would be better by now. My, mine is uh, 15, 20 years old. Mine's still the old wood style. <laughs> oh, how fun. I love those old wood yeah, and they're, they're great. I, f- I figured the uh, the newer plastic ones were, were a good upgrade, but I, I don't have any personal experience with those ones. It seems – so they, they have like, you know, just the metal or whatever cabinet style ones. And if you can get ones that are, I would say, older than a year because it's – I just see a lot of posts on the ones, the newer ones. And like I said, I don't know for sure when they started, but I've seen probably 20, 30 posts on social media where they said that the egg trays, um, something, they slip and then the egg tray falls and breaks out of it. Oh, that'd be a good way to ruin your day. Yeah. But um, yeah, when I worked at the Raptor Center, I don't know what brand it was, but it was an old wooden style cabinet incubator and and so i just think those are the best <laughs> yeah yeah i love them i know there's and i'm trying to think of who else makes the cabinet ones i know brincia makes some but i know they're a mm-hmm. lot more expensive i think for the equivalent that you can get a 1505 sportsman for from gqf i think they're somewhere in the 800 dollars range and i think the uh equivalent uh from brincia is like 1200 dollars or something like that that's how much i paid 800 for my uh i think about 800 for my uh our com my 50 max uh-huh. so and it's just you know it's not a cabinet it's just an oversized regular flat incubator yeah. i don't know what what it's technically called but yeah the sportsman's are the way to go so does yours does that have uh, turners in it or do you have to put your own turners in it or do you do it manually so it has a little floor that has a gear that moves it back and forth so you can put um egg trays in it that are different sized so i think so it's a 50 which is for means it'll do 50 chicken eggs but i think right. it'll do 120 quail eggs gotcha when i did it last i think right right about there i guess that's when, one other thing to talk about too is about turning i guess we didn't talk about egg turning did we we did not did you do, so you don't have to turn any ears by hand no it has an auto turn oh, in it. do you know anybody that turns theirs by hand anymore because i don't no and i feel bad for somebody that does <laughs> <laughs> yeah so do, do yours have um so what are yours set to? Are yours adjustable or how often do they turn? You can change the angle and the time, but to be honest with you, I just put it – it has different menu options. So I just put it on quail and push go. Yeah, and that's all I think. I mean mine – so on that Brincy, it's the same way. I, I just I just set it and forget it. You can adjust it every 20 minutes to 90 minutes to ever however many hours, but I mean as long as it's at least four times a day, it's fine, right? And I, I don't know if mm-hmm. any – egg turner that does it anywhere near that infrequent that usually you're turning it every hour you know yeah which which is plenty that's that's as long as it's four times a day or better there's no problem i feel like out of all of the different types of eggs that i've incubated quail are definitely the easiest i I think you could just put them on the counter and they would hatch obviously not literally but (laughs) i've I've heard stories of people that hatch them in their ovens (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) i i believe it (laughs) So do you are yours usually hatching? Do they usually hatch right at day seventeen? Do you ever have any stragglers that go into day nineteen? You know, it's been a little while. It's been several hatches since I've done quail, but I feel like everybody was pretty synchronized. Um, I feel like eighteen day eighteen nineteen, everybody was popping out of their shell, and if they didn't, then it wasn't a viable yep. viable egg. Same same for me. And I've noticed some of the ones that hatch out later too or end, end up dying too. The, yeah. the ones that are that are actually out day seventeen and sometimes they'll even hatch on day sixteen. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those ones usually turn out the best. Do you stop turning the last three days or the last two days of incubation? Again, it's auto set for that for the quail. So I know it's with the chicken eggs three. it's last three and I I feel like with quail it's the last – I'm almost positive it's the last three because I've had issues with them hatching a day early when the turner's still on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've done it both ways and uh, two days and three days and uh, yeah, I've, I've found it works. It works either way. I was just wondering what your your experience was. You know, I've only done probably five batches of eggs for the incubator so I'm definitely not um, not an expert on the quail I've done everything from quail to pheasant to emu yeah. to ducks to everything. And um, Well, I think they're just about – I mean I think a little – people get a little too worried about the specifics on each particular bird for mm-hmm. temperature and humidity settings and all that. I mean the days are obviously different, so you got to stop the, that turning the last two or three days so they can orient to hatch. But you know, I've I, I found that 
that that 90 whether it's 99 to 100 degrees a half degree difference hasn't really made a big difference to me if it's if i set it at 99.5 and it stays at that and i keep it at at you know you know 30 percent humidity for the first bit and then the last two three days during lockdown i put it to like 60 65 mm-hmm. percent i found that it does it does just fine for that for quail as it is just as well for chickens and ducks and everything else. I think the only thing that really matters is the, the, the number of days and when you stop the the turning for the lockdown period. Yeah. I mean, of course, if you want optimal settings for the highest hatch rates, but I find it hard to believe that let's just use chickens because quails aren't very good mothers, but the, uh, you know, a chicken that sits on her eggs for 21 days is going to maintain exactly 99 and a half degrees oh, yeah. and 55% exactly. humidity for the whole time. And that's if they never time, move. You know? That's if they never get up to right. go feed themselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the variation, I mean, yeah, you might not get a 98% hatch rate, but it'll be, it'll be good enough and, in most cases. And you know what? I don't even think that affects the hatch rate. I, I yeah. think the only thing that, that it makes a difference in is how soon they hatch. I think maybe you can get an, a, a, a half a day. You know, if you if the temperature is a little higher, maybe you get a, a half a day earlier or something. But but I don't even know unless you, unless you like you know bake your eggs at 110 degrees or something like that, <laughs> yeah. or, they, or they drop way low like below 90 for an extended period of time. I, I I don't even know that it does anything other than delay or or speed up the the hatch process. I think, I mean. It- yeah, you'd have to really drop to low temperatures for a while. I mean, you can always get those weird deformities and stuff, but I mean, for the most part, we have issues with um, our power goes out a lot. And I know that we had the last time. So the last batch of eggs that I got from a breeder was kind of a nightmare and it wasn't it wasn't you. I'm just going to preface that. <laughs> I've um, experienced <laughs> it, though. I know what you're talking about. I've had yeah. the same experiences. Yes. So the first one I got and a bunch of them sh- came broken. So they obviously had a rough handling and I had, I ordered like 150 and I set 120 and I had less than a 50% hatch. So that seller sent me more because they had a policy where if they had a poor hatch, they would send you more. And the next one arrived less broken. So I know they at least traveled better. And I feel like on that one, we had a power outage issue where we lost power for like four hours. So I think out of 120 eggs, I got like 20, 20 babies. Yeah. So obviously that wasn't the breeder's fault. But um, yeah, I've, I've definitely had some challenges with, with quail eggs at times. Yeah. <laughs> I can uh, I can solve that problem for you too. This is something I, for, I forgot to, to talk to you about. So I'm developing a product right now that I've, I've actually used the beta model for. Um, it's a Wi-Fi incubator monitor. So you, oh. you can track your temperature and humidity um, via a little sensor that goes inside the incubator and you can monitor it from your phone wherever you're at as long as you've got an interconnect connection there to connect to the sensor. Oh, cool. um, and I've actually that it's actually saved two of my hatches <laughs> so far from that and it'll it'll monitor your humidity and your temperature so you can set your parameters if it goes spikes a little high or low it'll uh, send you a an alert if the humidity goes too low or too high it'll send you an alert and like I said it's it's a beta model right now um, but we're actually developing it for a incubator specific um, setup and it'll actually have like uh, you know uh, the app that goes with it will be able to track your hatch and all that too, and maybe have some some other features in the future. But uh, I'll have that on the website too. It's called the Temp Stick, and it's just the uh, that it's used for other applications, and that's kind of the beta model that that I'm using right now. But we're developing it with that company to uh, have a a uh, incubator specific uh, sensor set up for it too. That's awesome. I I've lost uh, a couple different um, things of eggs due to malfunctions so and you never know, you know about you're it, right? at work you come and, home and you've yep. got yeah you have a poor hatch and you don't know that you know the power went out while you were away at work and then came back on a few hours later and you're you know if it's in the winter and it's sitting in your garage or something it's gone down yeah. but by the time you get back the temperature's back up and you never know that anything happened and so you start kicking your butt wondering what you did wrong yeah it's a, it's a pain i think that happens to people more, more than they realize and ruins more people's yeah. hatches and experiences <laughs> than, than we realize yeah i'm i'm sure the joys of hatching Right. Do you know if your product and and this is just a general question, but 
so like let's say you know a power outage well then you of course you lose your internet would it have any way to send an alert yes. to your phone it'll it'll, oh. it'll tell you if internet has been lost or or if it's been reconnected or, or any of that yes oh cool i didn't know if it could you know had an alternative way to send but i know so many times i work 48 hour shifts and granted my my husband my husband's a city slicker that i drug into my farm life so bless <laughs> his heart but <laughs> so he doesn't like mess with my stuff but you know so unless Unless I get a notification from our security system that we lost power, you know, I, I don't know. And then I can't ask him. We have generators, which he can go home and put, you know, my eggs on it, the generator. But, um, you know, if you don't know about it, then then you're up a creek and it sucks. Yep. Yep, exactly. Yeah, this is all like it runs off two AA batteries that will last a year uh, or better um, before you mm -hmm. have to replace them if it's continuously on and yeah it'll it'll go the whole time and if it's running low on battery it'll send you an alert if it's gonna if if you lose internet um it'll it'll alert you and then if it ever reconnects to it again it'll send you another alert said hey it's been reconnected so yeah oh, how cool. yep they've got all the bases covered on that i need that in my life so i'll have to make sure i follow your social media and your website and once that thing comes out, I will add it to my arsenal because that's there's nothing worse. Especially, there was one time I was hatching um, eggs for a customer, and of course lost power. And then you're like, you know, that's even worse than when it's your own eggs. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. That's exactly what happened to me. I I have two feed stores here that I hatch out chicks for, and that's what happened to me. Instead of delivering, you know. 200 eggs they were, or 200 chicks they were expecting it ended up being 60 Oh no! <laughs> because I've had that happen. Do you have an ETA as to when that'll be available to the public? So this fall, we're going to be going into development. And if all goes as planned, then spring of 2020, they should be available. Oh, cool. um, and that, the only difference in that will be that it has the accompanying app that will allow you to to track your hatch and everything. Now, if, if you don't want to wait for that, you can still buy the temp stick um, and use mm -hmm. it the same way. Um, it just won't say on the app that it's for the for your incubator. You know, it'll just be the temp stick. Um, yeah. You'll be able to to track it yourself, and you'll just have to use a different app to track your hatch. I was just saying, it'd be nice to have just one app that you can do everything in. Right. Yeah, and that that's the idea, and and it'll get there. Um, if you don't want to wait, you've got that option for the temp stick. But yeah, that that's kind of the idea, trying to make it all. Make it easier and give people peace of mind so when they go to work, they don't have to worry about, you know, something going wrong with their incubator. And if something does, they can have somebody hurry to come over and, and get things yeah. straightened out for them before it becomes detrimental. Will it be sensitive enough that you can calibrate your incubator to it? So it'll it'll be just something that's uh, standalone. So you will need to set your incubator parameters uh, separately. All, all this is a, is, is a monitor. Um, if sales go well with it, um, there has been talk of an entire incubator that oh, wow. that will have the whole system uh, built into it. So it'll be an all-in-one Oh, that's unicorn. really smart. Like a smart incubator. Right. How is there not one of right. those already? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, if this goes well, and uh, and I think I think it'll be it'll be received well on the market. And uh, if it is, that'll be the the next step in the future is to to build that. Uh, yeah, like you said, that's a good name for it. The the smart incubator. Yeah, <laughs> I might have to uh, keep that jotted down. That might be the new, the new name you see plastered on the cover. You you have exclusive rights. <laughs> I release them to you. <laughs> I have it on recording. No, I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> but as far as like I use uh, external. Um, oh my goodness, thermometer. That's what that thing's called. Right. And my incubators now just to make sure you know since they're electronic and make sure that they're the thermometer and my display on the incubator are reading the same so would you be able to to calibrate and set you know make sure that your incubators calibrated appropriately on that temp stick um no so the, like i said it's going to be all internal just in the temp stick itself i mean you can set your your parameters to for temperature oh so it doesn't display like no it will to your phone so the sensor itself won't you won't be able to open up your incubator and look at it it will just be to your phone um, so if you want you want to display on the outside of the incubator, you still will need uh, uh, another one to monitor oh, no, on the outside. Not, not to display, just to set your incubator, like to make sure it's calibrated appropriately. Oh, right. Um, the calibration on it. I'm trying to think. I don't know if there is. I don't know if it's self-calibrating. That is a good question. I'm, I'm not above saying I don't know. So I'm going to say I don't know. I do know that it is way more accurate. The The one thing I noticed when I first started messing with the, with the temp stick is – um, I got a so I've gotten 
eggs from the same breeder many times before and on on shipped hatching eggs uh, it's usually for especially coming from a from a long ways away it's going to be around 60 50 60 percent that i've yeah i found was coming from a long ways but this these got shipped in the middle of winter the coldest part of the winter got to me i incubated and got 80 percent hatch rate on on these Holy shipped cow. eggs and what i noticed is that that the temp stick it, it's a better sensor it's higher quality and it's a lot more accurate and i was using two or three other thermometers different ones different models um from from the uh the standard style like you know it looks like the the, the stick inside a turkey type you know it's yeah. got the the needle on the, the end probe. i don't know what you call it mm-hmm. the analog or yeah the pro oh, yeah. style the uh so i've used those type uh, and a couple of different ones that you can like get on amazon some better ones and some cheaper ones um for humidity and temperature sensors and they all show you know variations in, yeah and that thing i found when i used it it was showing everything else was um, up to two to two and a half degrees higher or lower and mm-hmm. the humidity was like five to ten percent different wow. um, on some of those. And when I've been now that I've set my incubator to match what the temp stick is telling me the temperature is, and use that for my monitor, even though my you know sensor is telling me I'm at one hundred and two and a half degrees, um, I'm actually at ninety nine and a half. And since I started doing that, it's been improving my hatch rate. So the, oh, okay. the the quality of that sensor is a is a big part of it too. Yeah, that's. I guess maybe I worded it wrong and I apologize. That's what I was trying to ask is because I, I convinced that my incubator isn't actually running at its displayed temperature. I, and that's stuff. such a thing that everybody, and that's one of the things we're trying to solve with this is that everybody has that, you know, they, they're, they get a bad hatch rate. And that's one of the things they're thinking is, Oh, oh my incubator is failing. And a lot of times it's not, it's, you know, the, an incubator is a pretty simple machine with the, especially if it's, you know, a still air, but I mean, even the forced air ones, it's a fan and a heating element, you know, and it got the electronics to shut it off or slow it down when the temperature gets, you know, a, a little bit above what it's supposed to be. There, there's not a whole lot to it, but the, a lot of times that thermometer they give you, that's where they cut the corner. It's yeah. uh, with all that stuff they put into it. They just put a cheaper thermometer in it. And that's, it's not really yeah. the incubator that's the fault. It's usually the thermometer. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds really cool. I'm, I'm gl- excited to hear that you're, uh, that you're developing that. And I'm, maybe it's cause I'm a millennial or whatever, but I think, you know, I'm, I love tech stuff. So no, <laughs> I get excited way. about I'm, that I'm stuff. right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> how cool. So how can people find the urban aviary online? Um, so if you want to check out the YouTube channel, if you want to learn more about how to, how to raise quail, uh, you can just search for urban aviary on YouTube. You'll, I'll be the first thing that pops up there. Um, if you want to uh, look at some of the products they have, uh, you'll go to the urban uh, um, and then also if you want to join a discussion on you know everything backyard agriculture and, and quail uh, specifically you can go to facebook and search for the the urban aviary facebook forum there's also the urban aviary uh fan page there you can follow that as well um but make sure if you want to actually connect with uh, everybody else in the community to go to the search for the facebook forum the urban aviary facebook forum Okay, great. And we can put links to the description so that people um, can just click through and then they don't have to uh, try to find you, which it sounds like would be pretty easy to do. But um, we'll just put the direct links to that and the store and to um, the products that we talked about on the show as well. So thank you, Jaren, for taking the time to talk to us. I really enjoyed talking to you. I feel like um, if I didn't know a single thing about quail that after after gaining all of your knowledge and expertise, I could start my own quail colony and be successful from the start. So I really appreciate you sharing all of, all of that information with us. Well, thank you, Nicole. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks. And thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, a podcast by HeritageAcresMarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All of the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.